Psalms 40 for the director of music of David, a psalm. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. He is risen. Good morning and welcome to New Hope on this Easter Sunday. It's good to see everybody. If you will bow with me, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer first thing. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning singing songs of praise, wonder, and gratitude. We serve a God who is greater than the mind's imagination. Your love and mercy are never ending. Your love is so deep that you sent your own son to die for our sins to die a humiliating and excruciating death on that cross, a death of a criminal, completely undeserving. The earth shattered, hearts broke, and darkness loomed. But our Jesus, our Jesus, turned the grave into beauty. Death, you have no sting. We glorify your name, Lord, for you are the beginning, the middle, and the end. We know we have a life eternal because of Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Let us go into this service with hearts wide open and worship with overflowing praise because you are worthy. All of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to begin this morning um, We welcome, with Blossoming of the Cross. We welcome everybody over the next three songs to come forward, grab a flower, and place it on the cross. This is to represent the beauty that came from Christ's death.
that saved my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory. Oh, what love, no greater love. That saved my life, yes, the blood, it is my victory.
together again. Worthy. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. 
By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. He is risen. He is risen. We, did you, uh, we did you an Easter favor. Well, first of all, we kept the kids in good order during that whole processional thing, didn't we? And now we're at the place at which uh, we'll probably fall apart, but that's okay. I love having the kids here. Um, we did you a favor by not doing a lot of uh, announcements, but I do need to announce one thing, and that is the books that we're going to read together, hopefully, read together as a congregation during the summer are available. Pick one up, one per family to start with. We'll figure it out later. We may be able to go farther than that, but the books are in the foyer. You'll see them. It's called Liturgy of the Ordinary, and uh, it has to do, it's, it's a book about how your everyday life has things happening that can be an arena for God to do uh, good things. Ordinary things like waking, making your bed, brushing your teeth, losing keys, et cetera, et cetera. And these books are available back there and in the walkthrough area here. I'll be reading along with you this summer, although I'll be reading the book in cafes in Croatia and Romania, but uh, we'll read it together. And then the other thing I might throw in is there are also some little stickers. I'm not sure how we got those. Sally, did we, those came with the sweatshirts? Okay, we got some like for your car. Or you know what, for other people's cars. Just, <laughs> no, maybe, maybe that's not a good idea, but pick up one, pick up a couple, and we'll see how far they go. We'll try to spread them out. We'll continue to make them available for the next few weeks, the stickers. Uh, have our 200th anniversary motto on there, newhope1823.com. Uh, so there's that. Well, uh, I'm going to start with a little Easter history for you all. Sunrise service got... Um, 19th century English poetry, so uh, you're maybe slightly better off than the first or than sunrise service. But let's start with some Easter history. Did you know that the first uh, Christians who celebrated Easter celebrated all the events that we associate with Holy Week? Did all those things on one one day. And it was a feast called Pascha, a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew word for Passover. So passion, what we call the passion, and passion in the sense we use it around Easter time refers to uh, suffering. It's an old word for suffering and it refers to Christ's suffering. Passion, the cross, resurrection was all folded together 
in Pascha. There is, of course, something to be gained in spending or, or spreading out the final chapters of Jesus' story across several days, because then the various moments of the story have uh, time to breathe. A Good Friday lets us focus on Jesus' suffering on the cross and then lets us contemplate what it meant for him to be dead. On Good Friday, we very intentionally leave Jesus in the tomb and we depart in silence. We haven't done a Monday Thursday uh, service here in a few years, but such services recall a specific event, Jesus' last supper with his uh, disciples. And they help us think about what the Lord's Supper means. And hopefully during a Monday, Thursday service, we are brought to our knees beside Jesus to wash the feet of other people. There was a week ago uh, from today, there was a Palm Sunday an opportunity to remember the way that Jesus entered Jerusalem. And we usually do that here with a processional of kids waving palm branches or whatever kind of vegetation we can find. Uh, that Sunday, interestingly, Palm Sunday, is alternately celebrated as Passion Sunday when the church remembers the sufferings of Christ. And we might even throw in Lent as part of this big picture. The six weeks prior to Easter during which the church prays and repents and listen, listens uh, in preparation for Holy Week and especially for Easter. That's a lot of story. There's, there's much to unpack there. And there are things to be gained, as I say, by telling the story slow and spreading it out across many days. But as is usually the case with trade-offs, there's also something lost, too. Uh, like, like the unity of the story, each of the pieces has its own meaning, its own message, but how it all fits together can stay unclear. But the Christians who first celebrated Pascha, who celebrated Easter, had a rather cohesive picture of what God had done through Christ. And it was expressed in the earliest Christian hymns that we have of Easter. Listen to some of these, or you'll be able to see them. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Another one. Before the dawn, Mary and the women came and found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They heard the angelic voice, why do you seek among the dead? As a man, the one who is everlasting light, behold the clothes in the grave, go and proclaim to the world, the Lord is risen. Listen, he has slain death and he is the son of God, saving the race of men. And finally, thou didst descend into the tomb, O immortal, Thou didst destroy the power of death. In victory didst thou rise, O Christ God, proclaiming rejoice to the myrrh-bearing women, granting peace to thy apostles, and bestowing resurrection to the fallen. In those earliest uh, Easter lyrics, death and life are held together. These early worshipers had a very clear, big picture understanding, I would call it, of what had happened in Easter. Easter is God's victory over death. As a couple of those hymns say, basically, at Easter, God used death 
to beat death. And in that formulation, the suffering of Christ and his death is very much a part of the victory story and must be held together with the resurrection because they are telling the same story. So this Easter morning, I want to go uh, old school on you, very old school, and hold the passion that that story of suffering uh, together with the resurrection, which is our usual focus on Easter, and explain why, why it might be important to do it that way. Uh, first of all, why does the passion, why does the suffering of Christ matter? Uh, is torturous Holy Week that we plod our way through, is it critical to the story? I want you to stick with me for a moment because I want to do a very quick overview of John's gospel, which, we, which Logan read from uh, just a moment ago. 50 or 60 years ago, there were a lot of scholars of the book of John who were saying that John's gospel is really two disjointed parts. And that's interesting because I think that's the tendency oftentimes in theology to break things into pieces. And they said, what you've got at the start, what begins in chapter one, with that famous, in the beginning was the word, reminiscent of Genesis, what you've got is this word that was with God and the word even was God. All of that leading up to key moment in verse 14 of chapter one, which is probably something like the thesis of the book of John where he writes that the word, the word that was from the beginning, was made flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. God's, or, or John's is, is the gospel of good, the good news of incarnation that God takes on flesh to be among us. And then what follows for the many chapters after that is what the embodied ministry of Jesus looks like. Until, so said the scholars that like to divide John into two parts, until we get to the passion, which they said doesn't really fit in that well at all to the whole incarnation story. Uh, but the cross and the resurrection was a story that early Christians knew and so John sort of had to work it into his gospel and, and so he sort of forces it in there and what we end up with is a story of Jesus in two separate parts. The story of his becoming flesh in the world, the incarnation, and all that end of life stuff. John Baer has written a book, I'm slowly working my way through, that is entitled, John the Theologian and His Paschal Gospel. And the title sort of gives away his argument. He sees the whole of John's gospel as basically an Easter story. Even the, the opening chapter of the book is paschal, is Easter-oriented, hinting of the story of Easter that is ahead. John writes that though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him which certainly seems to be a premonition of what is ahead when Jesus goes into Jerusalem. And the point from the book that I want to highlight for you on this Easter morning is that John Baer suggests that the incarnation, 
the story of God becoming flesh, in a sense, only reaches its fullness during Passion Week, when God embraces and fleshed life in the worst form of it. The incarnation includes Jesus bearing in his body all that suffering of Holy Week. And the, pre the, the passion of Christ shows just how with us is the with us-ness of God. God is that much with us. As the writer of Hebrews seems to argue, we have a savior who has been there, done that, who has faced anything that we have to face and usually much worse. And so he sympathizes us. Jesus is in the passion with political prisoners who've been erased from society by those authorities who are in power, who have been erased for not very good reasons sometimes. He is with those who experience injustice because he was treated unfairly. He takes his place beside those of us who are racked with pain and can understand that because he has felt plenty of it. In the passion, he takes his place beside accident victims, chemo patients, mothers in childbirth, and old men like me going through kidney stone pain. Because he experienced it himself, he is with the lonely and the rejected. Those whose friends have looked away at the time when they were needed the most. He is with those who live in shame because he was mercilessly mocked and his own body was stretched out on a Roman cross, the primary aim of which was to cause public shame. Crosses were sort of like a Roman billboard that said, what writhes, writhes before you is no human, it is an animal, a non-person. Forget them. They don't matter. Jesus knows shame. He is with the dying who worry about what will become of loved ones uh, when they're gone. Because he looked down from the cross on a mother who was about to bury her child. He is with those who pray in agony because he prayed in agony and sweat blood. Uh, that original slide of Pascha that I put up, uh, I actually just ran across it this morning if you wanna know about procrastination, but I, I ran across the, the image there. Uh, Chris and I have been a couple times, and the kids too, to Dachau, the, the Nazi prison camp. Um, that's now a memorial to the Holocaust. And that slide is in the Orthodox chapel that is there on the grounds. And it has Christ at the gates of Dachau releasing the prisoners. Christ was even there. And above all, he is with us in what all of us will eventually face, and that is death. Jesus embraces what the Apostle Paul calls our final enemy, enemy number one. Scripture makes clear that Jesus rather intentionally walked toward 
what would ultimately kill him. Not a death wish, just a battle that he need, knew needed to be fought. If God was going to defeat death, it would be by way of death. I think of that in, in a, a sports analogy. I think of Easter uh, as, as a, a football field and the play that God runs is something like a full back up the middle. You know, God running into the heart of Satan's defense. God heads straight into death to clash with death and finally beat death. You won't catch me many Sundays uh, retweeting the Pope to you, but early this week, uh, Pope Francis, Johnny, are you leaving because it's Luther? You're kind of, kind of got Lutheran blood. <laughs> I'm kidding. No. Here's what Pope Francis tweeted at the beginning of the week. God chose to enter our human history the most difficult way possible, the cross. And that's a bingo. Johnny says bingo, so uh, I like that. Bingo. Uh, this is, that is exactly what Christ's passion demonstrates. He goes through the unthinkable for us. And then the tweet goes on. This way, no one could ever be so desperate and not, not to be able to find him. Even in the midst of anguish and abandonment, God arrived in the very place we didn't think he could be. He became flesh to the horror of the cross. So while the mention of incarnation usually leads us to think what? Usually leads us to think, oh, Bethlehem and the baby. It would not be inappropriate to make a Golgotha the ultimate symbol of what we mean when we say God took on flesh and lived among us. And it is only the suffering part of the story that reveals the full significance of his resurrection, of which those early hymns sing about how he descended into the tomb, how he sl slew death, how he trampled death by death. Logan read for us from John's gospel. What that actually is, is that is the, the long prayer of John 17 that Jesus prays before uh, the passion, uh, spoken ahead of the passion. And in that part of the prayer, Jesus prays for himself. And he says, uh, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. And then a few verses down, he says, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that uh, with, with the glory I had before you, before the world began. Uh, uh, an American, somebody from our culture might read that and think it's sort of an odd prayer, maybe a little proud, maybe a little selfish. Glorify me. Who would pray that? Please restore me to my previous heavenly glory, the glory I enjoyed before this horrible mission that I've been on because I'm done. I found out that this hurts. I don't want to be a part of this, but I don't think that's it at all. First, Jesus prays that he might be glorified in order that it might bring glory to the Father. And secondly, I think in the passion and in the cross, Jesus has so identified with us that his, his glory becomes our glory too. There are a lot of, uh, um, a lot of the Paschal icons are scenes of a, of a, a biblical scene. I don't think we r completely understand, but it's called the harrowing of hell where Jesus in uh, his death uh, 
goes to the place of the dead. And these icons have Jesus going down to the place of death, uh, reaching in and pulling people up. I don't know about the harrowing of hell, but I think that is a good image of what happens in the resurrection and why the resurrection happens. Jesus descends to be among us in order that he might grab us and pull us out of the death that we live. Coming, coming near to us, he opens up his life to us. And we have the opportunity to identify with him so that his life becomes our life. His resurrection, ours. His victory over the grave is ours. His glorification is not just his glorification. It's the glorification of the Father and it's the glorification of us too. It's a glory that we all share. Um, I, I love the... Uh, I love this kind of slide. There are different versions of this kind of thing, but a slide that puts the passion, puts uh, the suffering of Christ up against an empty tomb, and they face each other. They are the two parts that make the, the wonderful story work. The Paschal, the Easter, mystery is that God took on flesh and descended into our suffering in order that we might ascend with him. He's risen. We've been speaking of mysteries this morning and we now transition to another uh, mystery to the Lord's table for uh, Easter communion. God has promised that his nearness to us continues now through loaf and through cup. Let's celebrate that. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, good. All right. Um, before we start, I know we probably have some guests at New Hope today. Um, we do um, say anyone who claims Christ as their Lord is invited to take communion. So if you did not pick up a cup, they're located in the back. Um, if nobody stands up in like two seconds, I'll go ahead and start. All right, cool. Um, so I had two thoughts this morning when I was coming up with this. Speaking of procrastination, John. Uh, I wrote mine, I think, while you were talking, actually. <laughs> um, so typically, of course, we go with the uh, communion route, and that's what we look, look at and focus during this time. But I was kind of pulled to this story about um, Mary Magdalene, given that it is Easter. So I'll start with a, a quick reading from John. Um, Mary, or Jesus appears to Mary. The disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not realize it was him. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them the things that he had told her. So, she went to the tomb to lament the one that she loved and of course thought she was dead. And I think as believers in Christ, that's something, a trait that we should consider modeling our faith after, uh, which is stubbornness. Uh, stubbornness in going to Christ even after he was dead. 
even when our faith is hidden and seems dead and God doesn't seem present to us, we need to continue to reach out because he is there and continue to be stubborn in our path towards him. Um, take a few minutes for silent prayer if you would like. All right, in Luke chapter 22, um, after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it, saying to them, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you by the hand of him who is going to betray me, is and mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the man that betrays him. Good morning. We come now to the time in our service where we pray for ourselves as well as others. I would invite you to take out your prayer list if you have one. And if you didn't grab one this morning, well, on your way out, there should be some by the back door. And I'd like to start this morning by challenging you. I'd like to challenge you this week to take this prayer list and to diligently pray over it. I had someone say to me recently, I don't know some of the people on there. And my response may have been a little flippant, but it was, that's okay, God does. And I think we need to remember that. I would challenge you, start at the top or the bottom or maybe with one part of it, and pray for these people this week. There's power in prayer. God calls us to pray for others. I would like to highlight one on here for you. Um, it's been added since last week, and that would be number 22. We want to remember the family of Carol Everode, and that would be Debbie Ritzline's sister who passed away. I also would like to add one praise to this. Had an exciting morning in that I got to, uh, to talk to Ernestine a little bit. And I hope she doesn't mind that, but it's always good to talk to Ernestine. Um, but she's just praising God for some recent um, changes in her sister's condition. Um, Mary Miles uh, was expected to have her foot amputated. And at the last minute, uh, the doctor realized that uh, circulation had been restored and that that would not be necessary. Now, he does not expect her to have a full recovery. Her toes are essentially dead, but uh, he decided they did not need to take the foot. And that's a miracle. So I join and encourage you to join in praising God for Mary Miles. And let's continue to pray for her. Are there any that you would like to share with us this morning? Something or someone that we're not aware of? Well, we've got a number of folks here today that uh, are recovering from various things and dealing with various things. Nicole's got her crutches down here. Steve's with us this morning. I saw Connie Alka earlier. We've got a lot to be happy about. 
But we've also got some other folks that are recovering and in need of prayer. So let's go to prayer now. Heavenly Father, we come to you on this resurrection morning knowing that you are capable of all things. Knowing that the Father who raised the Son can meet every one of our needs. And you can meet us right where we are. Lord, we try to keep this list up to date. We pray for ourselves, we pray for family, we pray for friends. And Lord, a lot of times we pray for people we don't know. We believe that you want to hear from us this morning, this afternoon, this evening, tomorrow, and all the days of our lives. So we come to you this morning just lifting up every individual on this prayer list, every group on this prayer list. Lord, we come here in freedom this morning to celebrate. But if we look on the back of our prayer list, we're reminded that there are some people in this world that don't have that freedom, that luxury. Lord, we also know that one reason we have this freedom is because there's a lot of people out there serving in the various branches of the armed forces. People related to us, people that are friends. And we just pray for them today, as many times they are away from home and away from family. Lord, we do believe that you are the great physician. We believe you have gifted doctors with their skills, nurses with their skills, surgical teams with their teamwork. We believe you have blessed researchers who look for new surgical techniques, who look for new medicines. We believe you are capable of all things. So Lord, we just pray that you would meet the needs of the people today. Be God in whatever way they need you to be God this day. And we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Now I would invite you to rise and sing in victory. Because He We thank you for the empty tomb. We thank you that he lives and he reigns forever. As we close this service, Lord, I pray a blessing upon everyone here this morning. I pray a blessing upon their families, upon their lives. As we depart now and we go out into the world, might we take the good news with us. For he is indeed risen, and we are people of hope. We pray it in his name.
Amen. Happy Easter.